it's always a pleasure to be in the Clancy. The lights are so bright on your face, you can never see the audience. Um, the previous speaker has ruined my life. Um, and I want to do uh, something different. What we are doing by treating people with anxiety disorders is empowering them to live their life. Not taking away things, <laughs> making them better. Okay, um, well, for the first thing, importance of anxiety and depressive disorders, they account for 60% of the burden of mental disorders. And anxiety and depressive disorders are twice as common in women as in men. You all know that men just take to the bottle and are beastly. Um, now, how did we get into this game? I've been running an anxiety disorder clinic at St. Vincent's, initially at Prince Henry, now at St. Vincent's, for 34 years. And we decided there was no point in us offering a diagnostic service, because it's very simple, as I'll show you. What we wanted to do is to treat people and get them better. And as everyone could prescribe medication, uh, we specialised in psychotherapy, cognitive behaviour therapy. I'd actually paint people with purple paint if it would make them better. I'm not at all doctrinaire. And purple paint delicately applied behind the ear. You do understand. Um, we started off and we were famous. I mean, most GPs in this town thought that our clinic was wonderful. They'd ring up, we'd take people in, we'd organise them through a treatment program, they'd get better, and that was it. And within about six years, we gradually began to build an incredible waiting list until it was eventually nine months. And then all GPs in this town hated us with passionate hatred. I'd meet them and they'd say, Gavin, you're totally useless. And, and that's true. Um, so we worried about this. We manualized the treatment program. We trained GPs how to do this themselves. Um, all to no real avail. So one day we thought, we'll computerize it. 10 years ago, 2003, we'll computerize it so that one standard treatment suits all according to diagnosis and people just do it over the web. In other words, we took everything we knew about each disorder and distilled it into a simple computerized package. Looks simple, is simple, and works. Now there are problems. Um, CRUFAD, which is the Clinical Research Unit for Anxiety and Depression, um, is disseminating ICBT, and this is part of my dissemination, of course. Now we do well. And each week for the last five years, 40 papers published that week around the world have referred to our research. We've had 10,000 citations in the last five years. So we're doing something right. Not all the papers are saying we're rubbish. Um, we're doing something right. And last year in Health Ed, I talked to 6,000 GPs, including being here. Uh, last year was about depression. This year is about anxiety. And a GP who's a friend of my daughter-in-law said, Gavin says that ICBT works but I can't quite believe it. I use it probably less than I should. And that, I think, is my problem. It's awful when your daughter-in-law tells you what your problem is. Um, OK. The website's that thiswayup.org.au slash clinic. Um, courses for worry, OCD, panic, and shyness and of course for sadness and worry and sadness. They all teach control of emotions, thoughts and behaviours in six lessons over about 10 weeks and we charge people 55 bucks for access, 180 day access to the software. That's about half the price of uh, any uh, antidepressant that you might prescribe. And we've proven the efficacy in 15 randomised controlled trials. Nice. And We've now got 2,500 GPs 
or psychologists or psychiatrists in descending order registered to use it. And we advise that you include anyone with a PHQ-9 score or GAD-7 score uh, greater than nine, and those scales are in this handout that's in your canvas bag. Um, and we say you should exclude people with schizophrenia or bipolar or so on, and people who are on benzodiazepines or people who are actively suicidal. We don't think we've got a panacea. We advise people to treat carefully, but GPs will do what they want to do, as you well know. Prescribing off-label is life. And 6,100 patients have now registered, and half have come from non-metropolitan practices, which is great. It means we are able to get out into the bush where services are rare. Now, nothing to do with inter uh, internet-delivered cognitive behaviour therapy. Three things I want you to understand about normal anxiety. First of all, when an untoward event happens and you get startled, the flight or flight response takes over because that's what will enable you to run away from the saber-toothed tiger. And you need to explain these symptoms to people when they say, I suddenly got the palpitations. And you go, what was going on? And you go, ah. Oh, well, that's probably the flight or fight response. And you just lay it out for people and they go, oh, I was worried I might be having a heart attack. Explaining the normalcy of anxiety is valuable. Next, explaining the Yerkes-Dodson curve is fundamental. And you all know it. It's just that you've never drawn it for a patient. Please draw it. It's not hard. It says when you're very relaxed, your performance is suboptimal. When you become tense and alert, your performance is optimal. And when your anxiety becomes too severe, it robs capacity and you become hopeless. So anxiety is useful because many people with anxiety think they know that anxiety makes them stupid, but they think that any anxiety is bad, and it's helpful to say, hey, no, it's good to be tense and anxious and psyched up. And lastly, as a model of anxiety, um, as an event, and the first thing when an untoward event occurs is to say, is this a threat to me? And if it isn't, it's not an issue. And if it is, then you'll become aroused, and the extent of your arousal will depend on your nature, the extent to which you have an anxious temperament or high neuroticism, as the trade is, is called. And if you become aroused, you'll get symptoms of the flight or fight response. And this is pretty standard. And there are only two things to do that work. One is to make certain that the arousal doesn't become incapacitating uh, by using the slow breathing technique to make certain people don't hyperventilate. And the other is to do problem solving so that they start to deal with the untoward event which is threatening them. Common sense, but you can do it. In the management of mental disorders, most of you who joined the Better Access Scheme at the beginning got a two volume set called Management of Mental Disorders, and on page 271 are uh, complete instructions about the slow breathing technique, and I know that all of you put it in your bookcase and have never opened it again. Good. Well, that's four years ago. Now you can get it out. Um, nothing very clever about it. Ideal for making certain people can control their level of anxiety and therefore make certain that it facilitates and doesn't debilitate. Next, you can do structured problem solving, and that's on page 40 of the Management of Mental Disorders, and it's very standard, and you have these overheads, so I won't go through it. And if you don't have the Management of Mental Disorders and you'd really like a copy, we'll send you an electronic copy of the pages I'm talking about. Just email me. Now to disorders. There are six anxiety disorders, and I'm going to talk about the first four. 
And for all of them, CBT, over the web, or face-to-face, or SSRIs, work and are used. And all the others are not. And these are treatments, not crisis remedies. Crisis remedies is all about slow breathing and problem solving. You shouldn't dope people up who have a problem. They need to solve it. Right, generalised anxiety disorder. I was the chair of DSM-5's committee on generalised anxiety disorder, and my committee unanimously wanted it called major worry disorder because they said the guts of it is persistent chronic worrying. But the New York Times heard of this and said the American Psychiatric Association are pathologizing normal behavior. Now anyone who worries, uh, is Junior's new girlfriend suitable for him? Will be called uh, having a mental disorder. And so the APA, I think, sensibly just withdrew from us and said, Gavin, it's been lovely work you've done. Now bugger off. But it really is persistent worrying about future concerns, and the worry is initially seen as helpful, because you might work out a solution um, to deciding whether Junior's new girlfriend is a good lady, Uh, and then as excessive, and then as exhausting. And it's accompanied by feeling keyed up, and muscle tension, and avoidance of situations where the outcome's uncertain. The real trick to treatment is to stop doing what doctors automatically do. We are all brilliant problem solvers. With our high IQ, our glorious experience of the human race, anyone brings us a problem. Doctor, I have a bruise just here. Could it be leukemia? Certainly, madam. I'll do a blood test and that will tell it. We are problem solvers. Good. When you've seen the lady for the third time with with new problems, all different, You say, hang on, are you a worrier? And she said, of course. Sort of in brackets, what took you so long to understand? And you say, okay, let's see if we can help you with this chronic worrying, because it's wearing you out. And they say, yeah, sure is. And so what you do, there's a book, Overcoming Worry, which Lisa Lampy from Royal North Shore published about four years ago in Sydney. Cognitive behaviour therapy, there are four trials of internet CBT, two hours, number needed to treat 1.8, and uh, there's medication, citalopram, fluoxetine, um, cipramil, Prozac, never benzodiazepines, very simple stuff. This is uh, a lady, this is our treatment program for GAD, The lady wakes in the middle of the night and says, what if I forgot something that the kids need for school? I'll look like a bad mother. The teachers won't write a good recommendation for the kids' high school applications, and then they won't get a good education, so they'll never get a decent job. Hello? When we launched this program, four women rang up by noon and said, how do you know how I think? Because this is the sort of future worrying. Each of the steps is plausible, it's just the whole five steps together is nonsense. Are we clear about this? I hope you think it's nonsense. Anyway, lesson one is all about that and about the three parts of GAD, disturbance of thoughts, emotions and behaviour, and about the slow breathing technique. And lesson two is about the flight or fight response, and challenging worrying thoughts. And lesson three is identifying negatives and testing out and challenging the negative thoughts. And lesson four, with this wide-eyed lady, um, controlling behaviours, learning, using exposure. And lesson five, identifying assumptions and beliefs and challenging them. And lesson six, relapse prevention. On the surface, looks very simple. Cartoon storyline with which patients identify how did you know how I think, and then downloadable homework that gives them exercises and structure to do, which they wouldn't pay attention to if you just gave it to them as a typewritten sheet. Here's a couple of hundred people uh, identified in general practice with GAD and prescribed our course, nothing to do with us, GPs around Australia. Um, 
45% were mild. <coughs> the majority got better. But actually, um, six worsened. No magic. You wouldn't expect. There's 45% who were moderate. The majority got better. No one worsened. But some didn't get fully better. And here's the 10% who were severe. And no one got worse, but not everyone got fully better. But across the board, 65% improved, recovered, so they no longer met criteria. 15% improved, 20% did not, and work loss days halved. This is really powerful treatment. Um, panic disorder, agoraphobia. Sudden attacks of fear and safe surroundings is what we mean by panic attacks, and panic disorder means recurrent panic attacks and avoidance of situations for fear of panic. And the worry is not that they'll have a panic in the situation. The worry is that the anxiety will be so severe that it will damage their body or their mind, and they'll collapse and die or go crazy. The threat is to themselves, not to the, you know, being in a difficult place. So pay no attention to the place because it's trivial. And a panic attack is short. Um, here's someone whose blood, uh, heart rate goes from 70 to 110 in a minute and a half and drops back to 70 uh, within nine minutes. And this is typical for a panic attack. And the treatment is exactly the same as uh, GAD, major worry disorder, CBT, face-to-face -face or over the web. There are eight trials of internet CBT in panic. Uh, only two are ours. Medication with SSRIs. You are now able to write the treatment for any anxiety disorder. It does not differ. You just use different words. In social phobia, the severe anxiety in social or performance situations are when under scrutiny. Because people fear that others will notice the anxiety and think ill of them. It's a character judgment. Gavin Andrews is stupid, is the thought. And treatment is identical. And there are 16 trials of internet CBT because we all thought that the social phobics would be locked at home uh, watching something unmentionable on their computer screen um, and therefore would love to do our computerized treatment. And uh, six of those trials are ours, or medication. And the core issue is for people to realize that others don't devalue them. I was on Drive... 2BL Drive one night talking live about this, and a guy rang in, and you know you cringe when he says, I was a patient of Dr. Andrews and did the internet course, and you think, oh God, what's gonna happen? <laughs> um, and he said, it's great, I'm 55 years old, I run a company, and all my life I've had to steel myself to address others or to be with others as the center of attention. Because I thought they could see I was anxious and tense and would think how stupid I was to be anxious and tense when I've got this successful company. And he said, during the course I began to look around and they were smiling at me. So I've wasted 50 years of my life running away because of that fear and it's no longer there. And I'm now empowered to be me. Obsessive compulsive disorder, persistent, unwanted, intrusive thoughts about blasphemy, con contamination, harm, or sexual outrage. Boring, isn't it, that the human race can only be obsessed about four things. <laughs> and the compulsions are simply acts performed to neutralize the possibility of the obsession coming true. And treatment? It's very nearly the same. It's a graded exposure to feared situation and prevention of people carrying out the compulsion. And as they sit there, over 20 minutes, they stop being anxious. It just gradually, and they say, well, I thought it, my anxiety was 10 out of 10, but now it's sort of 2 out of 10. That's strange. But do you think 
the stove might have caught fire? And you go, don't know. No reassurance. And they go, oh, all right. Well, I'm not anxious enough to go and have a look and I can't smell anything. Um, <coughs> there are two trials, one's ours, and we're currently recruiting. Uh, so if you've got some people with OCD who would love to join us, they'd be welcome. And again, medication with SSRIs, never with benzos. Now, Ramesh says, before I leave, I've got to provide you with one slide that carries the core issue so that you can put it into action on Monday. My staff, who are not given to praise of the boss, said, Gavin, this is the most useful thing you have ever written. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Um, look, the core symptom in GAD is worrying about the immediate future, the what-if things. And the treatment is ICBT to help them manage uncertainty so that they do things in which the outcome is not certain and find out that they can cope. In panic, the worry is that the anxiety will damage them. And the treatment is to teach them how to manage the anxiety so they no longer fear it. What if I have a panic? I now know how to manage it. Cured. Ooh, doctors don't use that word. In social phobia, others will think I'm strange. Treatment? Ability to confront social situations, manage their anxiety and inward looking things so they start to look around and find that people do like them. Great. In OCD, the worry is what if contamination or harm occurs or there is a vengeful God if blasphemy is my issue. Uh, and ICBT is don't check and find out nothing goes wrong and your anxiety drops away and the obsessions stop. The anxiety disorders are simple. So, you know what I want you to do. Um, what my daughter-in-law's friend said she should have done. <laughs> Register, get a prescription, pres use it, maybe do a mental health plan if you want to, call it self-help. Receive emails about your progr patient's progress and get your practice, your receptionist or practice nurse to give them a call saying, doctors pleased you've done lesson two. Patients will love you forever and be loyal to your practice. It'll take two minutes. And they're not dependent and they don't want to use up lots and lots of time and there's no danger. You remain clinically responsible. It's not time consuming, it's not difficult and you should all be doing it to, you know, Monday. Um, <laughs> Patients log on with the prescription number you gave them. It's a written, you download and print off a prescription. <coughs> they pay $55 for 180-day access, and they do each lesson. Cartoon storyline, the homework, they, there are lots of other resources, uh, and they get reminder emails to keep them at it. And we get 60% adherence. That is, 60% of people in primary care referred to do one of these programs complete it. You can't get 60% of people, you write a, an antidepressant script to take it as you intend it. That's what Seidler said, and I believe him. His garden's full of discarded scripts, he said. Um, and the results across the board are standard. That of the people who complete, 50% recover, 30% improve, and 20% do not. And you should get a second opinion for the 20% or have another look at them yourselves. Of the people who drop out in our, we've looked at this, um, really a third of them drop out because they'd achieved what they wanted. Not everyone needs six lessons. A third of the people who dropped out, particularly after lesson three, had got understanding of their disorder, so they'd made sufficient progress, so they were well and empowered and recovered, and they didn't have to give up alcohol. <laughs> Maximal benefit, minimal harm. <laughs> Testimonials, patients say, great, I could just get on with doing what I wanted to do. Doctors say, the routine work is done by the system. It frees me for the difficult cases. It's like having an intern in the practice. So, you know what you have to do. Those of you with a high-end mobile phone, would you currently pull it out now and register? 
over coffee, and those of you with an iPad with you, would you kindly pull it out and register? There is no excuse for sloth. Thank you. <laughs>